This is a recording of excerpts of the United States Committee on Banking and Currency hearings on the stock market and buying and selling equity securities. The person questioned by the committee is Benjamin Graham, author of The Intelligent Investor. The acclaimed book is the favourite of investor Warren Buffett, who tributes it to changing his life and commencing his investment strategy, which made him the greatest investor of all time. Your narrator is Ian Whitaker, copyright 2017 IDP. The chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Graham. In connection with your own company, does it invest in a representative sample of the best stocks in the market, or does it use some other guide for investment? Mr. Graham, no, we have not been purchasing the market leaders. Our business has been something of a speciality business. We have emphasised the purchase of securities selling under intrinsic value, and have gone to what is generally known as special situation. The chairman, would you tell us what specialty situations are and how you approach it? How do you determine whether special situation is undervalued or not? Mr. Graham, there is a slight distinction between an overvalued security as such and a special situation. I shall try and make that distinction clear. In the first place, with respect to a special situation as it is known in Wall Street, that is, a security upon study is believed to have a probability of increasing in value for reasons not related to the movement of stock prices in general, but related to some development in the company's affairs. That would be particularly a matter such as recapitalization and reorganization, merger or so forth. The typical example of a special situation is a company in trusteeship undergoing reorganization. Because of the fact that it is in trusteeship, the securities tend to sell at less than their intrinsic value. When the reorganisation is completed, the proper value is established, and there will normally be a profit in the purchases of such securities. There are other examples of that kind. The public utility breakups were a very interesting generic group of securities, because we had an underlying situation in which these holding companies, being in ill favour in general with the investing public, tended to sell at less than the value of the constituent companies. With respect to undervalued securities in general, not special situations that would be based upon a process of security analysis which shows by study of the company's balance sheet and income account that it is selling considerably less than its intrinsic value, which in general can be defined as considerably less than the value of the company to a private owner. The Chairman. How do you evaluate management? Mr. Graham. Management is one of the most important factors in evaluation of a leading company and it has great effect on the market price of secondary companies. It does not necessarily control the value of secondary companies for the long pull because if management comparatively is poor then there are forces at work which tend to improve the management and thereby improve the value of the company. The chairman. When you go into special situations and buy large blocks do you usually try to get control of the company? Mr. Graham. No. That is very exceptional. I would say that out of about 400 companies that we may have invested in in the last few years, there would be not more than eight or four in which we would have had an interest in acquiring control. The chairman. You would have if you thought the management was bad, would you not? I mean, that would be one of the principal elements in that case. Mr. Graham. That could be a reason for our seeking control, hoping to improve the management situation. The chairman, how do you go about acquiring large blocks without disturbing the market too much? Do you do it in your own name, or what is the procedure? Mr Graham, well, there are two procedures. One is to acquire shares in the open market over a period of time. The other is by making a bid for a specified or unspecified number of shares, which is made public and which all stockholders have the opportunity to accept. The chairman, I assume that you specialise in special situations. You analyse it and after considerable work I take it you decide that it is undervalued and is a good special situation. You start buying in the market and you reveal your interest and everyone knows what you are doing. I wondered how you proceed. Mr Graham, that could happen, but very often it does not. I give you an example. In a book I wrote, The Intelligent Investor, I gave an example of an undervalued security, the Northern Pacific Railroad stock, which at the time of my first analysis sold at 20 and later went down to 14. We decided to buy a fair amount of stock 
I should say that after reading the book once or twice, I convinced myself the shares should be bought. We went ahead and acquired about 50,000 shares of that stock in the market with comparatively little effect on the price. The chairman. Were there a lot of shares of that? Mr. Graham. There were about two and a half million shares altogether. The chairman. That is a pretty big company. Mr. Graham. Yes, indeed, but that was a large investment for us. But there are other instances in which where companies are smaller, it is not equally feasible to acquire shares in the open market, and it might be desirable to make a bid or offer, as it is generally called, to acquire shares in some public way. The chairman, you make no effort to conceal your interest in a special situation or to deal through trust companies or other accounts? Mr. Graham. Well, in most of our purchases, the vast majority of them, the purchase of shares is the same way anyone else would through brokerage houses who act for us, and there is no concealment. The Chairman. To your knowledge, are there many instances of concealment of the purchaser in acquisition of stock? Mr. Graham. Well, you might say that virtually all companies that are acquired in the open market, I mean where control is acquired in the open market, in virtually all these cases there is some degree of concealment. That is to say, nobody publishes the fact that he and his group are acquiring control in the open market. It would obviously be unwise from a business point of view. Sometimes the news gets around, but generally it is unofficial. There have been a few instances, comparatively few, in which efforts are made to acquire control of a company generally through a reputable bank or trust company where the name of the purchaser is not revealed. In other cases, it is revealed. The chairman. We have had suggestions that this is done, and I was wondering what the process is and whether or not you do it or have done it. I wonder if you could describe for us the way that you can acquire control without revealing your identity. Not applicable to yourself necessarily. How would anyone do it? Mr. Graham. Well, outside of the method of acquiring control in the open market, which I've said before is the most customary way, the other method would be to ask a bank or a trust company to communicate to the stockholders an offer to buy the shares generally at a price above the market, and state the acquisition is being made for clients of the trust company without giving their names. The chairman. There is no requirement if a trust company purchases stock on the exchange to reveal the beneficial owner. Is that right? Do they not have to say, we are buying this for Mr Jones or Mr Smith? Mr Graham. No, obviously not, sir. The chairman. So that would be the usual way, simply to use an established firm which is in and out of the market for your agent to purchase for you. Mr Graham. Yes, that would not be a trust company. Normally that would be a brokerage firm. The chairman. Does a broker have to reveal who his principal is? Mr Graham. No. On the contrary, it is one of the basic principles of Wall Street that relationship between the broker and the client is confidential, and the name should not be revealed except to authorities who have legitimate reason to ask for the information. The chairman. That is an important exception. What about a trust company? If the Chase National Bank purchases shares and they are asked by the president of the exchange to whom they are buying for, do they tell them? Is it the same as the broker? Mr Graham. The president of the New York Stock Exchange has no authority over anyone except members of the New York Stock Exchange. The chairman. Well then, there is a difference. As to the brokers, he has access to the beneficial owner, but he does not have as to the trust company. Is that right, Mr Graham? That would be true with respect to the president of the Stock Exchange, yes. The chairman. Who would have control? The SEC? Mr Graham. As a reservation, I am not certain of the constitution of the stock exchange, the president's power to ask the brokers for the names of their clients or their dealings, but I assume that in the investigations that the stock exchanges make into its own dealings, including such as manipulation and so forth, such information is asked for and given. The chairman, I understand that with regard to the members for disciplinary purposes that they have the right to inquire, but I would not be too certain about that. Mr Graham, I believe that is so, but I'm not sure. The Chairman. When there is a battle for control of a company, the stockholders who intend to remain with the company would want to know whether they should participate in the battle or should sell out, and the identity of the purchaser would be important to them in such circumstances, would it not? Mr Graham. Well, if you are speaking for a battle for control in terms of proxy battle, of course the identity of the people who are endeavouring to obtain a majority of the votes by proxy solicitation is absolutely vital, and the proxy rules require that complete disclosure be made as of the identity of such persons. 
With respect to purchases of shares, however, that is entirely different matter. And the theory of the stock market is that people are allowed to purchase shares anonymously. It will be a little embarrassing for many people if each time they bought and sold shares, their identity would have to be revealed. The chairman. Of course, it is not done customarily, but it is subject to being revealed in an investigation at any time, is it not? Mr Graham. As far as I know, the revelations of purchases of shares have been limited pretty much to criminal activities. I do not recall cases in which the names of buyers have been revealed, even though they may be known to the authorities, merely because these people can happen to have bought stock. The Chairman. Do you recall Lawrence Portland Cement Company? Did you make an attempt to gain control of that company? Mr Graham. Yes, in association with other people, who at that time I believe were either the largest or second largest holders, we made a bid for a specified number of shares. It did not succeed. The price advanced above our bid price and consequently we did not get any quantity of the stock. The Chairman. Do you think that was an instance of their having known that you were interested and having great respect for your judgment and it went up before you could get control? Mr Graham. No. On the contrary, what happened was that the company itself went into the market and forced up the price above our bid price. The Chairman. Well, I do not know how it could have been otherwise. You could have not purchased that amount in the open market, could you? Mr Graham. No, but we made a blanket offer to the stockholders to turn in their stock to us at a given price, which was above the market at the time the offer was made. The Chairman. What was your offer? Mr Graham. I think it was 26 a share. The Chairman. When was that? Mr Graham. Four years ago, perhaps. The Chairman. What is it selling for now? Mr Graham. I do not know. The Chairman. Has it been split? Mr Graham. It has advanced and the name has been changed. Dragon Portland Cement. The Chairman. I am told that allowing for the split, it is now selling at 130 a share. That vindicates your judgment, does it not? Mr Graham. I wish we had been able to buy it, yes. The Chairman. Was it true that in this case you got no stock at all? Mr Graham. No, because our offer was a contingent offer. We made an offer to the stockholders to buy their shares at a price above the then market provided a sufficient number of shares would be deposited. What happened then was, as I said before, that the officers of the company, not wishing this bid to succeed, went into the market and pushed the price of the stock above our price. As a result, people did not turn in any number of shares to speak of, and we dropped the whole thing. The Chairman. I am not sure. Do you wish to discuss these individual cases or not? Mr Graham. Well, I have no strong feeling on the matter. I do not know to what extent it would be useful to the committee. If it is useful to the committee, I have no objection. The Chairman. I do not wish to embarrass you about it. I had understood that it was quite all right. The only purpose is that we have had a number of people here who have discussed general principles. None of them, I believe, were what we call active traders. I suppose that is where you are, is it not? Mr Graham. We do not consider ourselves as traders in the ordinary sense. Technically, you might call us that. The Chairman. What I was trying to do was to illustrate procedures that are followed by people actually in the market. If you do not care to be questioned about individual cases, I would not want to press the matter. Mr Graham. I have no sensitivities on the subject at all. We are very proud of our achievements in our company. The Chairman. I thought maybe you were a little reluctant in the case of the Dragon Cement to discuss the details. Mr Graham, I am not reluctant, Senator, except I do not remember the details too well. I was not active personally in the matter. The Chairman, can you think offhand of other similar examples of intent to gain control? Mr Graham, you mean examples similar to the one made in Lawrence? Well, there was one recently. I'm trying to remember the name. I remember that a trust company in Boston, the Chairman, the Atlantic Gulf or West Indies Steamship Company... Mr Graham, no, that was a different situation. You are referring now to our own experience. The Atlantic Gulf and West Indies was quite a different situation. At the time, we made an agreement with the chief stockholder of that company to purchase, I think, the greater part of his holdings and made a corresponding bid to everybody else to buy their shares at the same price, which was considerably above the market at the time we began our negotiations. The Chairman. Was that a negotiated sale you were trying to effect off the exchange, or was it a listed stock? Mr Graham, yes, it was a listed stock. The negotiation was done with the large stockholder, and the rest was an offer extended to all the stockholders on the same terms. The Chairman, 
Was that negotiation directly with the stockholder, Mr. Graham? That is correct. The chairman. Did it succeed? Mr. Graham. Yes, it did. The chairman. You did not use an intermediary in that case. Mr. Graham. No, that offer went over our name, I believe. The difference was this. At that time, we had already arranged to buy a large amount of this stock, and we felt that, for one thing, that should be a matter of record, and was made a matter of record. The chairman. So that is an illustration of the successful way to purchase control of a company. Mr. Graham. Yes, it is much more desirable to buy it by negotiation to begin with. The chairman. Do you think there is any serious problem from the public's point of view with regard to the anonymous purchase of stock, especially with regard to gaining control of a company? Mr. Graham. Senator, I have observed this thing for the last 40 years. I cannot think of a single case in which the public has been hurt by offers to buy control whether the names were revealed or not revealed. In every such instance, the public has been helped because they have been able to get a higher price for their shares than they would have been able to get if no such bid had been made. The Chairman. You see nothing wrong with that procedure. I am not arguing with you. I am only asking you. Mr Graham. I have had occasion to think about the matter for a long time, Senator, and it seems to me that the true arguments are all from the public standpoint in favour of not preventing bids being made to the public at a higher price than the previous ruling. The Chairman. Is your company an open-end or closed-end company? Mr Graham, we are technically an open-end company and practically a closed-end company. Let me explain that. We are registered under the Investment Company Act of 1940 as an open-end company, which means that we are contractually obliged to repurchase shares at any time at the net asset value when presented to us. However, no such shares have been presented to us for a great many years. Our shares have sold consistently at well over their net asset value. Furthermore, we have not sold any shares of stock to the public at any time and have not increased our capitalisation for many years, so that we operate actually as a closed-end company, namely with a fixed capitalisation. The Chairman. What is the capital? Are these trade secrets or not? Mr Graham. Not at all. They would not be a secret in any case, Senator. But as it happens, our figures are made public. They are filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission. We have 5,000 shares of stock with present asset value in the order of 1,100 a share and with a market price rather considerably above that. The Chairman. A market price above that? Mr Graham. That's right. The Chairman. But the shares sell very seldom, I understand. Mr Graham. That is true. They are very infrequent sales. Nonetheless, there are quite a number of them in the course of a year or two. The Chairman. When was your company started? Mr Graham. The company was incorporated in 1936, but it was a continuation of a business which was set up in 1926. The Chairman, to what do you attribute your great success in this business? Mr Graham, well, Senator, that is assuming that we have made a great success. The Chairman, would you not consider it a success? Mr Graham, I will admit that we think it is, but I did not want to be in the position of passing over your question as taking for granted that we have made a great success. The Chairman, I will take responsibility for saying you obviously have made a success. Mr Graham, I think our success is due to having established sound principles of purchase and sale of securities and having followed them consistently through all kinds of markets. The Chairman, I take it that ordinary members of the public cannot buy your shares, is that right? Mr Graham, well they cannot buy them in unlimited amounts but they can buy them over the counter in small amounts. The Chairman, Are they quoted over the counter, Mr Graham? They are quoted over the counter, yes, sir. The Chairman, at what, 1,100? Mr Graham, I would say probably around 1,250 or 1,300 a share now. The Chairman, above the asset value, Mr Graham, that is correct, sir. The Chairman, is it customary for open-end companies to be selling above their asset value? Mr Graham, well, it is unusual for any investment company to sell above its asset's value, But there are a number of instances. The best known instances is the Lehman Corp, for which a good part of the time sells above its asset value. That, however, is a closed-end company. It is impossible for an open-end company to sell at more than the selling premium over its asset value as long as it offers shares of stock to the public. That is obvious. In some instances, a company like State Street Investments 
has followed a policy like ours and has not offered shares generally to the public, and the shares have sold at a premium. The Chairman. Do you personally control your company? Mr Graham. No, I am a comparatively small stockholder. The Chairman. You are? Mr Graham. Yes, sir. The Chairman. Does your family control it? Mr Graham. No, we have a comparatively small number of shares. The Chairman. Does any one family or person control it, or it is distributed rather evenly? Mr Graham, the shares are distributed fairly evenly. I would say it is a family with whom we have no relationship that represents the largest holding of the present time. The Chairman, if someone wishes to sell their shares, they still can demand what from you? Mr Graham, they can demand the net asset value. The Chairman, which of course they do not do because they can get more. Mr Graham, that is correct. We have not taken in any shares for many years. The Chairman, what inspired you to form an investment company? You did start this investment company, did you not? Mr Graham, yes. I may say that I entered the brokerage business in 1914 and became a junior member of a stock exchange firm. And in 1923, I believed that sound investing principles would be successful and I started a private fund in 1923 which was changed around in 1926. A private fund would be one in which no offering was made to the general public through advertisements, circulars, or in any other way, but merely to friends who were permitted and asked to contribute. The chairman. How large was that company? Mr Graham. It was about half a million dollars at the beginning. The chairman. Just you and your friends, Mr Graham. That is correct, sir. My own participation was very small. I had very little money. The chairman. You started buying stock, is that right? Mr Graham, stocks and bonds, yes. The Chairman, I would be interested if you do not mind telling us to have the history of this development. Mr Graham, well Senator, if you feel there is any value in this. The Chairman, yes there is, because we like to get some feel of how these trust companies develop. However, I do not wish to embarrass you. If you think it puts you to a disadvantage with competitors or anyone else, you do not have to. Mr Graham, no Senator, I have been accused of telling all my secrets. I have written a number of books, and I reveal them all in these books. The Chairman. I was particularly interested to know what happened to you in 1932. Mr Graham. We had a rough going. The Chairman. You first started at the beginning with half a million dollars. What happened until 1929? Mr Graham. We were quite successful and the fund grew to two and a half million dollars at the beginning of 1929. The Chairman. In stocks, I take it. Mr Graham. In stocks and bonds. The Chairman. What did you do in 1929? Mr Graham. In 1929, we lost money. The Chairman. Well, a lot. Did you go down with the market or see it coming or what? Mr Graham. We did pretty well in 1929 alone but the real difficulty we experienced in 1930 and 1931 when the market went much further downward than we had anticipated. We had pretty well anticipated the 1929 decline, and so our resources were shrunk pretty much. I do not think they shrunk as much as General Wood's pension fund did, which we mentioned before, but they went down fairly low, and it was not until 1936 that a person who had been with us in 1929 and had held on would find himself even but by 1936, he was even in our business. The chairman, you say you changed. When did it become a registered investment company? Mr Graham, it became a registered investment company in 1941 after the passage of the Investment Company Act. The chairman, what happened in 1936? Did not some change occur? Mr Graham, We incorporated for a very peculiar reason. We had originally operated as a joint account and the individual members reported on a partnership basis. The chairman, each participant in the fund, Mr Graham, that is correct, reported his share of the results. But before 1936, the Treasury claimed that we were an association taxable as a corporation and we had considerable problems as to where we stood, whether we were or were not a corporation. So our council said... You had better incorporate and settle this matter once and for all, because the Treasury will get you either way. The Chairman. This was the original group of friends, is that right? Mr Graham. That is correct. The Chairman. That is all you were in 1936? Mr Graham. There were accretions on the private business. I had more friends in 1936 than I had in 1923. The Chairman. When did you make them? During the Depression? Mr Graham. 
not so many as afterwards, the chairman. You incorporated in 1936 and in 1941 you registered. When did you sell any stock to the public or did you ever sell any? You have 5,000 shares, you say. Mr Graham, yes. May I say that we originally had more shares, that is. We sold stock up to 50,000 shares with a normal par value and stated value of $100 a share. The chairman, when did you do that? Mr Graham, well we did that in series by offering rights primarily to our older stockholders and that built our capital up to $5 million, consisting of 50,000 shares worth about $100 a share. But we discovered, and this may interest you Senator, that we were beginning to get a great many one share stockholders, people we had never heard of, who came in and invested $100 and then got our reports and found out what we were doing and imitated it. So to deal with that situation, we perpetrated a reverse split up in which we issued one share for 10, increased the unit value in the market to about 1,200 or 1,300 a share. And from that time on, we did not get quite so many one share stockholders. The chairman, what do you charge for managing the investment company? You are the manager of the company, is that right? Mr. Graham, I am one of three managers. The other two managers are Mr. Jerome A. Newman, who has been a partner of mine since 1927, and his son, Mr. Howard A. Newman. The chairman, is it public knowledge what you charge? Mr. Graham, yes, we charge a great deal. We pay ourselves salaries on the order of $25,000 and $15,000, and we have a profit-sharing plan under which after a $40 share dividend is earned and paid in any year, the management as a whole receives 20% of the additional amount earned and paid. The chairman, are your earnings largely capital gains? Mr Graham, yes, very largely capital gain. As a matter of fact, you might say they are almost exclusively so. The chairman, I hope it is clear that if you do not wish to say, if it is a matter that you do not wish to discuss, particularly your own compensation, I am not trying to fish. This is just illustrative of what I assume is typically a successful man, and if you do not care to answer, I hope you will feel free to say so. Mr Graham, I would just like to make two remarks about that. In the first place, I have no hesitation whatever in telling you the things that the investors in my fund know, obviously. But secondly, I think it is a misconception to consider that we are typical managers of a successful firm. Our arrangement is very unusual. The chairman, I want to clear up the misconception. That is exactly why you are here. Why is it not typical? I would like you to describe what a typical situation is. Mr Graham, the difference is first that our compensation arrangement is much more liberal than that received by other investment funds. This 20% which we receive on excess earnings is a very large percentage. The chairman, but that depends on what you pay. You said $40 a share, which struck me as a rather liberal dividend. Mr Graham, that is just the base dividend. We paid $340 a share last year. The chairman, that is still better than General Motors paid. Mr Graham, yes, I just want to make two things clear, sir. One is that our compensation arrangement is much more liberal in its terms than the standard arrangement. Secondly, we believe, I think our stockholders believe, that we earn our compensation because our results to them after deducting compensation have been good. The chairman, I assumed that or you would not be there. I was trying to get a picture of this business. You are helping us a great deal, I may say. Can you put it in a little different terms so that we can compare your situation with the managers of some of the well-known firms? I would appreciate it if you would put that in the record so that we will have it. Mr Graham. Oh yes, the difference is tremendous between our own situation and that of a typical investment fund. Let us take the largest one, Massachusetts Investors Trust. Their capital may be 100 times ours. Their expenses are very much less than 100 times ours. Their expense burden is very little percentage-wise as compared with ours. The trustees receive compensation on the order of maybe one-fourth of 1% 1 on capital. The chairman, wait a minute, of earnings or capital? Mr Graham, that would be capital. The chairman, per year, one-quarter of 1%. One Mr Graham, no, I think I have overstated it. It might have been that much at one time. I think it is less now. As the capital grows, the percentage of compensation to the trustees has diminished. Frankly speaking, I should not be talking about this because I do not know it well enough, but I do know in general that their rate of compensation is very conservative in relation to the funds that they handle. The chairman, 
what percentage of the capital invested in your funds is represented by the compensation to management? Can you express it in terms of what would be comparable? Would it be 1%? Mr Graham, well, let us put it this way. Over a period of years, we've tended to earn about 20% on capital per year before compensation, and about 3% of that has been paid to management as compensation, leaving 17% for the stockholders. The Chairman, 3% of the earnings. Mr Graham, no, 3% on capital out of the 20% earned on capital. The Chairman, I do not follow you there. You earn 20% on the invested capital per year, is that right? Mr Graham, that is roughly true on average. The Chairman, what percentage of the 20 did you get as management? Mr Graham, we got about 15%, the reason being that there is a 4% deduction first. The Chairman, 15% of the 20% earned. Mr Graham, that is right. Not 15% out of 20 leaving 5 but 15% of 20. The chairman, leaving 85% of the stockholders of the 20. Mr Graham, that is right. The chairman, I understand that. Maybe it is a silly question and you never do it, but is it ever translated into a percentage of the capital invested per year? Mr Graham, well these figures I'm giving you start with a percentage of capital invested. The chairman, no, that is earnings. Mr Graham, well we earn 20% on capital. I may summarise once again, taking that as typical result on capital, the stockholders have gotten 17% on their capital, and we have gotten an amount equivalent to 3% on their capital. The chairman, I see, whereas the normal or average investment company, I take it, is less than 1%, is that right? Mr Graham, yes, that is certainly true. The chairman, you get three times as much as the average or better. Mr Graham, that is true. The chairman, well, I take it you are worth it. You manage it more effectively than they do. Is that not correct? Mr Graham, well, naturally we have to believe that and our stockholders believe that. The chairman, I take it you approach this whole business in quite a different way. Those big funds do not look for special situations. They go into the market and just buy the run of the mine, do they not? The blue chips and the bonds and so on. Is that not correct? Mr Graham, well... That is correct in a general way, but not completely. Some of the bigger funds, particularly like Lehman Corp, which is a large fund, has always had a rather keen interest in special situations, and a certain amount of their capital, by no means the major amount, has gone into special situations. The Chairman. When you say large, how large is Lehman? Mr Graham. Lehman would be over $100 million. The Chairman. Of invested capital. Mr Graham. At present market values. The Chairman. As compared to yours, Mr Graham, ours is on the order of six and a half million dollars. The Chairman, on market value, is that not the original investment? That is the capital as now valued on the market, is it correct? Mr Graham, that is correct. We have paid back to our stockholders virtually all the earnings that have been made, so that in a sense our present value is very similar to the amount of money paid in. The Chairman, you do not seek to increase the invested capital, I take it. Any particular reason for that? Mr Graham, the basic reason, Senator, has been that we have not believed that we could get the same satisfactory results on a very large capital as we can get on a moderate amount of capital. The Chairman, why is that? Mr Graham, because if you deal with special situations and undervalued securities, the markets in those for the most part are not very large. It is not possible to acquire an unlimited amount without affecting the market price, and if we had ten times as much capital, it would be very difficult for us to invest in it the same way as our present capital. The Chairman, I know some who have undervalued stocks down in Arkansas, in my hometown, who might want to talk to you about it. Mr Graham, we are always open to suggestions, Senator. The Chairman, there is no market for them. I believe you said in your statement that as far as whether the market is too high or too low right now, you could not say it is too high or too low. I take it that you think this is a period that requires caution and you do not believe in jumping in and purchasing stocks. Mr Graham, well, let us put it this way, Senator. Quantitatively, the market seems to be about right, but qualitatively, I consider it to be on the high side and getting into a dangerous situation. The Chairman, that is, I think, a very understandable statement. That ought to be plain to anyone. If it is about right, then it means it is not likely to go up or down, but is about dead centre. Mr Graham, 
On the contrary, Senator, it may be about right, but that is likely to be accidental. A year from now, pardon me, sir. The Chairman, I take it you meant the relationship between prices and earnings and income is at a figure that is not clearly undervalued or overvalued. Is that right? Mr Graham, I would say that this is true for the most representative stocks as a whole. The Chairman, there will always be exceptions both ways. Mr Graham, yes indeed. The Chairman, I am not trying to tell you you understand. I'm rephrasing it only for the purposes of trying to understand what you said. I haven't any idea about whether it is high or low. I'm trying to put in language so I could understand what I thought you said. Did you notice the testimony of Mr Galbraith the other day regarding the tendency of the market and speculators losing their relationship to reality and that the market generates enthusiasm all its own for capital gains? Did you notice that testimony? Mr Graham, yes indeed sir. The Chairman, would you agree with it? Mr Graham, yes I would agree with it in general terms. The Chairman, that is interesting because he is purely an academic figure and you are a practical one and yet this is one point upon which you agree. Mr Graham, I should say, Senator, I am something of an academic man myself. The Chairman, I did not know that. Mr Graham, I have the title of adjunct professor of finance at Columbia University and I give a course in the evaluation of common stocks. The Chairman, I saw you on television in an Ed Munro show but I did not understand that you were a professor. I thought they had brought you on as a practical operator to tell them how it was done. I misunderstood. Mr Graham, they made me a professor because I am a practical operator. The Chairman, that is very unusual, is it not? Mr Graham, yes, the Columbia School of Business has about four or five such practising professors. The Chairman, I see. I think that it is interesting because you agree that it is a dangerous element when the market becomes too over-enthusiastic and loses, as Professor Galbraith says, contact with reality. You think there is a tendency to do that at the present time? Mr Graham, yes, there are some tendencies, undoubtedly. The Chairman, then you would say, as he put it, I believe that there is too much speculative activity in the market. Mr Graham, well, too much is a difficult phrase to define. I think if the market continue pretty much as it has been doing now in regard to the total amount of speculative activity, I would not be too concerned about the outcome. I am afraid of the cumulative effect of more and more speculative activity. The Chairman, I am not sure that is different from the way he put it. I think he was careful to say he did not think that the level of prices was too high, but that during the past year there had been too rapid a rise that there had not been any developments in the business world, productivity, or all the other things that would justify that rapid rise. It was the rapidity of the rise and a tendency to generate a sentiment, as he put it, of over-enthusiasm that disturbed him. He recommended, as you know, an increase in the margin requirements. Would you recommend an increase in the margin requirements? Mr Graham, I would like to duck the responsibility to this extent. I said in my statement that I feel the Federal Reserve should have no hesitation about increasing margin requirements further if it became increasingly concerned over the extent of speculation. I do not think it is necessary for me to make the decision for my friend Bill Martin, but I think the Federal Reserve has good judgment as anyone in that connection. The Chairman. That is a proper answer. I see nothing wrong with that. It is not your responsibility. Some, though, have taken the position that it would be discriminatory or a bad thing to increase the margin requirements to 100%. Do you think if the capital gains tax were eliminated and there was no tax upon capital gains, that that would increase the attractiveness of speculation or decrease it? Mr Graham, on the whole, it would increase the attractiveness of speculation. The Chairman, if it did, that would tend to increase the level of prices, would it not? Mr Graham, that is my best judgment. It is true that there would be some unfreezing of shares now held by long-time owners, but my own feeling is that very likely the net result would be an increase in speculative enthusiasm. The Chairman. Is it fair to ask you now whether your own company, and you do not have to answer if you do not want, is buying or selling stocks? You can be perfectly free to say you do not care to answer. Mr Graham. We have been selling on balance from our general portfolio of undervalued securities and endeavouring to put our money into special situations which are not at the risk of the market. The Chairman. It has happened that in the past year or two you have made any particular study of any industry which is primarily dependent on defence contracts for its business? Mr Graham. No, we have no occasion to study them in any detail. We just have a general knowledge of the picture. 
Mr Chairman, would you care to elaborate at all about your knowledge of the defence industry picture? Mr Graham, well, it is common knowledge, of course, that the aircraft manufacturing companies are largely dependent on the defence programme. The Chairman, would the fact that a company which is wholly dependent upon the defence contract had profits which increased in the last six months of 400 or 500% a preceding year or similar period mean anything to you at all with regard to the government's contract with that company? Mr Graham. Senator, I did not state in my statement that I was chairman of the research committee of the War Contracts Price Adjustment Board during the war. That is the renegotiation board. And we had to consider principles of renegotiation, including the profits of aircraft manufacturing concerns. The mere increase in profits as such is not an indication that the contracts are improvident but there is a prima facie suggestion that they be examined into the chairman. Do you not think that 400 or 500% is a rather unusual increase in profits in the course of 12 months? Mr Graham, I do not recall any particular instances in which that ratio existed, but if it should exist, I am sure the renegotiation people will study that with care. The Chairman, do you think the Renegotiation Act ought to be renegotiated? It expired, you know, at the end of December. Mr Graham, I am convinced that it should be, or something similar. The Chairman, the administration has not requested it, has it? Mr Graham, I am not part of the administration, Senator. The Chairman, I understand they did last week. Yes, it was also in the State of the Union message. I had forgotten that. If nothing else happens in these hearings, maybe that is worthwhile but you are in favour of the reenactment of that. Mr Graham, yes indeed. The Chairman, would you mind commenting upon the situation, which I notice reoccurs in many instances? There was a notable one this morning in the case of DuPont, one of our big companies, and the same thing is true with General Motors, where so many of them have shown during 1954 a substantial increase in profits on the decreased volume. In some cases, of course, we saw in the figures of General Motors it was a difference in the excess profits tax. But I believe in many cases that plays a relatively minor part. What do you think is going on in our big industries that accounts for that? Mr Graham. Well, of course, the first point is what you have mentioned, that the good showing for 1954 earnings in the large companies, approximately equal to the 1953 earnings in the aggregate, is due to a considerable degree of the repeal of the excess profit tax. To some extent, it is also due to the fact that corporations, both large and small, have been getting somewhat better control over their costs in recent years. That, I would say, is more true, actually, in the case of the small companies than the big ones, because the small companies suffered the most from the costs getting out of hand. The Chairman, would such a circumstance indicate a lack of competition? Mr Graham, I do not think so, because for one thing the margin of profit in and of itself is no larger now than it was in previous years. In the case of General Motors, for example, their profit margin last year, I think after taxes, was about 8.2%. I imagine that in 1936 it was around probably 14-15% to after smaller taxes. But before taxes, I would say the profit margin is approximately the same, maybe somewhat less now than it was in 1936. The Chairman, you do not see anything to criticise about General Motors carrying all of the reductions in tax in profit rather than decreasing the prices. Mr Graham, my own views on that may seem peculiar to you, Senator, but I think that General Motors does not care to reduce its prices substantially because of the effect on the competitive situation would be disastrous. General Motors has to make a very good profit in order that the other automobile companies can exist at all. If it made a small profit, some of the other automobile companies would go out of business completely. The Chairman, why do you want to subsidise these other automobile companies at the expense of the poor farmer who is struggling along on a starvation diet now? Mr Graham, Senator, I did not suggest that. The Chairman, the prices for these Chevrolets are enormous. If they could cut them $800, it would help a lot. Mr Graham, I would like to make my point of view clear again. I am not expressing my own opinion as to what should or should not be done. I am only telling you what I think General Motors policy and that General Motors itself cannot dare in the present state of the economy and political sentiment to reduce its prices to a point where other companies were forced out of business and General Motors had almost a monopoly of the business. The Chairman. Well, in another way, you are saying there is no competition in the automobile business, are you not? Mr Graham. No, sir. That is not true either, 
because in the first place competition between General Motors and Ford is very keen and the competition between General Motors and Chrysler used to be very keen and now is again becoming keen. The Chairman, to show you how innocent I am, I do not understand it at all. I always thought the price happened to be the principal element in competition, that you could not have competition if you did not care what the price was, and that all the rest was shadow boxing and just make-believe. If you were really competitive and you desired to have the market, I had thought one of the first things to do was sell cheaper. That used to be the orthodox doctrine. This idea that the competition is just in advertising to keep the price up makes no sense to the old-fashioned man. It sounds exactly like the cartel system in Germany. We split up the market and all take our part. And then when we advertise and make people believe we are competing. And there is no real competition. If General Motors really is competing and desirous of obtaining the market, she would get in, would she not, by cutting the prices. Mr Graham. Well, Senator, my view of this thing may be wrong, but it differs quite a bit from yours. I think the competition that existed between General Motors and Chrysler, for example, was very intense, and its effect on Chrysler was almost disastrous. Chrysler lost virtually all of its earnings power last year, and although its business remained high in terms of dollars, it lost on sales cars to a point where earnings almost disappeared, and tremendous effort was necessary by Chrysler to improve its cars and to improve its selling practice. Now, that as far as I can see, is more or less classical example of the actual working of competition. The Chairman. I am afraid I gave a false impression. I am not now at least trying to express an opinion for or against it. I am trying to develop whether or not there is competition in the automobile field. I am unable to see that there is. In view of your statement that all General Motors needs to do to put them all out of business is lower the prices to where it could still get along and it would not go broke, but it could break its competitors. In orthodox competitive business, that is what happens, is it not? In the old days, that is what happened, is it not? I do not say I disagree with you that that would be a bad thing socially and politically it is dangerous. That is a different thing from saying that it is really competitive. Do you really feel that it is competition or do you feel that it would be inadvisable to permit competitive forces to have their full sway? Mr Graham, could I try and summarise my view by saying that I believe there is a great deal of competition in the automobile business today, but it is not competition carried to its final conclusion. I mean the destruction of the weaker companies. The chairman, it is sort of superficial competition. Mr Graham, it is a limited objective competition. The chairman, some of the bureaucrats or somebody developed a term called administered prices. Is that not what it is? They can get together and decide if you go below a certain amount, you can destroy Chrysler, and that is not wise to destroy Chrysler. Mr Graham, as long as you are speaking of economic principle, you must remember there is such a thing as optimum or maximisation of profits, and it is quite possible that General Motors, by cutting their prices, could do more business, but at the same time earn less money. There is no reason in the world why General Motors, as an ordinary business, should not charge such prices as will give it maximum profits. The Chairman. If it ran them all out with a monopoly, they could charge what they like. Mr Graham. No, sir. The United States would interfere. The Chairman. That is what I am talking about. You are getting into a different field and leaving the old-fashioned competition when you talk about interference by the government and what the social and political effects may be. I'm not saying this is a good or bad thing. I've heard it said before, and I was interested that you confirmed that General Motors could make a reasonable profit, I think that is the language, and still destroy all of its competition because of the way it is set up and its efficiency. If you like that term, or at least its distribution and volume, I would gather you agree with that. Mr Graham, I do not know the situation intimately, but I feel that probably is so. The Chairman... I think it is important simply because as your economy changes, these different aspects arise which do not involve things beyond the immediate profits of a company. I think it would be a great catastrophe if all the other companies were put out of business. I would agree with you on that, but at the same time I do not like to kid myself that they are out there fighting for business because they are not. General Motors could get it if it thought it was wise to do it and still not really injure itself. Of course... Its own personal advantage or disadvantage, regardless of the nation, would be another matter. If you do not mind, our staff director would like to ask you a few questions. Mr Wallace, 
In buying a company, do you confer with management to obtain information about the company which is not generally available? Mr Graham. Well, where the purchase was made by agreement with large stockholders who are part of the management, we would ordinarily, say, get a copy of the audit report and material of that kind which is not published largely. I think because it is just a matter of inconvenience to publish it. But I should add, in order to avoid a misconception, that I can think of no instance in which we have gotten information of importance which had any effect on our judgment, which information was not given to the stockholders in connection with the offer to buy. Mr Wallace, to the degree that the reports are published quarterly, you might get a report on earnings in between these reports, for example, which is not published. Mr Graham, well, that is conceivable amongst the report, but it would be very unusual if it had any effect. I might give you an example of that. When we made our offer to purchase the Atlantic Gulf and West Indies stock, and incidentally, I might say the offer was made through the Manufacturers Trust Corporation, we published, and I think at the suggestion of the Securities and Exchange Commission, with whom we had discussions on this matter before, a semi-annual balance sheet which had been supplied to us by the management and had not been made public. It did not give any particular information of value, but it was published as a matter of general policy. Mr Wallace. In general, when you buy a block of stock, do the people from whom you buy the stock have the same information that you have? Mr Graham. As far as any important pieces of information are concerned, I would say yes. Mr Wallace. But if you were to buy stock on the open market on the basis of information that you had gotten conferring with management, would this be considered trading on the basis of inside information? Mr Graham. No, sir, because as I understand the interpretation of the rules, trading on the inside information applies only to those who have fiduciary relationship towards the stockholders, namely officers, directors and major stockholders. Mr Wallace, is it not illegal for an officer of the corporation to divulge to you any inside information which is not available to the public? Mr Graham, I would like to clear that point up a little bit because I am on both sides of that fence. I am an officer and director of a number of corporations and I think it is worthwhile for the senators to get a realistic view of the way corporate affairs actually operate. A good deal of information from day to day and month to month naturally comes to the attention of directors and officers. It is not at all feasible to publish every day a report of the progress of the company in the newspapers or send out letters to the stockholders. On the other hand, as a practical matter, there is no oath of secrecy imposed upon the officers or directors so that they cannot say anything about that information which may come to their attention from week to week. The basic point involved is that where there is a matter of major importance, it is generally felt that the prompt disclosure should be made to all stockholders so that nobody will get a substantial advantage in knowing that. But there are all degrees of importance and it is very difficult to determine exactly what kind of information should or must be published and what kind should just go to the usual grapevine route. Mr Wallace. Of course, the SEC Act itself makes it illegal for an officer of a corporation to trade on the basis of inside information. The corporation or stockholders may sue to get their profits back. Mr Graham. Yes. Mr Wallace. We received quite a large number of telegrams the day, I guess 15 or 20, complaining bitterly that you were putting the market down, rocking the boat and all that. Would you agree with that? Mr Graham, no, I think I can say something that would be reassuring to you, Senator, and I put it this way. If the study actually does put the market down, then the market was due to go down and should go down. The Chairman, that is a very fair observation to me. It is a mighty weak market that this hearing could put down, is it not? Mr Graham, I would agree on that. The Chairman, now one or two things that have occurred to me. Did you notice Mr Eccles proposal yesterday on capital gains tax? Mr Graham, I read it in this morning's paper. The Chairman, does it appeal to you at all? Mr Graham, yes, I had a proposal of my own. I guess all of us have proposals on this thing. I think Mr Baruch will make one when he appears. We all have proposals. Mr Eccles' proposal basically is, I think, a sound one to differentiate more than the law now differentiates between the various holding periods. The Chairman, your proposal, I thought, was simply a temporary device, and then I assumed a return to what we have. Mr Graham, yes, that would be true. The Chairman, 
which is certainly worthy of consideration. The effect is that if you hold it in a really long time, beyond, say, five years, he was not dogmatic about the precise ending of it, that there would be no capital gains. Does that appeal to you, Mr Graham? On the whole, it does, Senator. You may recall that a number of years ago we had a capital gains tax of that type and that the amount of tax went down to about 10%, I think, on holding stocks between 5 and 10 years and zero, I think, after 10 years. So these graduations are largely a matter of judgment, but I think the principle is sound. The theoretical objection to capital gains taxes is that the taxing something which does not appear everywhere in the national income or the gross national product and so on. This theoretical objection could be met in part by this gradation. The Chairman. This is a rather technical question, but perhaps you can help us. While I realise it is difficult to generalise, would you give us your best estimate on how much market value of a dollar of retained earnings in comparison to a dollar of dividends is paid? How much market value in dollars? That takes a few sentences to answer. In the first place, I have made studies on the subject and I've written on the subject. And in the past, it was possible to show that a dollar of paid out earnings had four times the value of a dollar of retained earnings in their effect on the market for the average stock. The exception being stocks that were bought mainly for their long term prospects and were treated in the market in a separate category. I have a feeling, however, that we are now going through a transition period on the question of weighting of dividends as against retained earnings. I think the transition is going on fairly rapidly. I cannot tell you just where we stand at this minute, but I will predict that in a few years from now, the weight of returned earnings will be better, considerably better, than it had been against the distributed earnings. The Chairman, is that not very largely influenced by the tax structure, the difference between the capital gains and the normal surtax rates? Mr Graham, well, no, sir. It has not been influenced in the past. On the contrary, behaviour of investors and speculators has been very illogical. In theory, they should have preferred retained earnings by successful companies because those companies were subject to only one tax to begin with and ultimately only to a capital gains tax in addition, whereas the distributed earnings were subject to two large taxes immediately. However, the ingrained desire of investors for dividends was so great that it has not yet adjusted itself to the facts of life in the tax structure. It is only beginning now to do so. The Chairman, I see. What you mean is they will slowly catch up. Mr Graham, they have been extremely slow and I think extremely unintelligent. The Chairman, that is a very understandable statement. Incidentally, do you think that stock options are largely motivated by the desire to compensate directors by capital gains rather than salaries? Mr Graham, well sir, it is the desire to compensate officers by capital gains. There is no doubt about it at all. That is the admitted purpose of stock options. The Chairman, no, it is not admitted by some of the people that we have had on the stand. They say, oh, it's just to inspire loyalty. It has nothing to do with the retaining of earnings. You do not subscribe to that, Mr Graham? No, I do not, sir. The Chairman, I agree with your views quite often. Mr Graham, Senator, I have no intention of shaping my views with the expectation of your agreement. Chairman, I did not accuse you of that. I was only impressed by your wisdom. Mr Graham, thank you, Senator. The Chairman. I used to be a professor. Maybe that is my weakness. You noticed this morning that Sears Roebuck has found a way to compensate the ordinary employees by capital gains, which I never realised before. It is not the effect of the pension plan. Mr Graham. It is provided you have got a Sears Roebuck type of company. If you had an ordinary company, let me add this, and this is very important. If you took an ordinary company at random on the New York Stock Exchange and tried to put in the Roebuck type of plan, not only would it be true that the returns would be comparatively small as against Sears Roebuck, but I think it would be impossible to maintain such a plan. Types of variations in results in the stock prices from year to year, the people just would not have the guts to keep up a plan of this kind in the ordinary company. Mr Chairman, well, a company like General Motors could do it, could it not? Mr Graham, I think so, yes. The Chairman, do you know whether other funds have this system of paying into the pension fund as much as 10% of their income before taxes as compensation really to their employees without paying the normal tax rate? Mr Graham, well, the only difference is the 10% figure that you're mentioning. 10% is a fairly high figure, but it is by no means 
unexampled. I wish you could think of the other companies, but there have been instances I know of more than 10% of the earnings going to a combination of executive and run-of-the-mill employee compensation. The Chairman. I do not believe the compensation to the executives was included in this morning's testimony. Mr Graham. The executives are part of this, but they are limited to this $500 a year figure, or whatever the maximum is. The Chairman. I meant in addition to that they have bonuses and stock options, which is in addition to the participation in the pension fund. Mr Graham. That is correct, sir. The Chairman. Which may result in an overall figure beyond 10%. Mr Graham. Yes. The Chairman. What do you think of that? Mr Graham. There are two parts to it. In the first place, I think it is a remarkably good device for establishing the proper relationship between the business and its employees and a fair treatment of profits. As I said in the beginning, we have a similar approach in our government employees insurance company and it has worked out very well for us and the employees. The tax status, of course, is another matter. It is a very favourable tax status in these plans that the Congress adopted and I am sure knowing full well what the consequences would be with the intention of encouraging this kind of development in corporate business and in the position of corporate employees. I think personally, even that the cost of some loss of revenue to the Treasury, it would be very desirable to encourage the development of medium-sized capitalist or in any event happy and prosperous employees at the end of their working career. The Chairman. I agree with you as far as you go. It is a fine thing if you look at only that. What do you say about these people who have no way of adjusting their income to capital gains and have to pay the straight tax? What is your answer to them? Do you say, well, it is too bad? Or how do you justify one set of employees receiving compensation and paying only capital gains rates and another set doing almost the same thing, paying another rate? If you were in my place and they blamed you for all the governmental policies, what would you say to them? Mr Graham, I would say what we are talking about is a marginal part of the total compensation of employees. In the Sears Roebuck case, of course, it is not so marginal because you have had this extraordinary success of the corporation itself. But if you take a typical corporation which sets aside 10% of its earnings for this purpose, the amount of additional gains and income to the employees would represent not an inconsiderable part of their earnings, but at least a minor part of their earnings and the tax advantage, I should think, should be accepted philosophically because of the desirable consequences that flow from it. The chairman, supposing they devoted 50%, supposing they reduced everybody's wages and transferred that to 50% payment into the fund. If you can accept the principle, why could you not pay them all on a capital gains basis? Mr Graham, no, the principle cannot be accepted to an unlimited application and the present act, if I understand it correctly, imposes a limitation on that. The amounts which can be put to benefit of employees in pension funds and profit sharing funds, I believe, are limited to 15% of the compensation in each year. The Chairman, I wonder if you would give us your views in a broad sense about the economic future of the next few years. Do you see any culmination of a business cycle, or do you subscribe to this view that I read the other day of one of your colleagues in the investment field in New York, that a final blowout is necessary? I read into the record an opinion that it always must come, that we must have this final orgy of buying. I wonder if you would give us an idea of your views for the next few years. How has your mind been working? Mr Graham, I will do it with the proviso that these views should not be taken too seriously. The Chairman, I do not believe you are infallible. Mr Graham, as a matter of fact, I have never specialised in economic forecasting or market forecasting either. My own business has been largely based on the principle that if you can make your results independent of any views as to the future, you are much better off. Nevertheless, as an economist of sort, I have studied this question and I will be glad to give you my view on this matter. I think that in all probability... We would have some economic recession of an appreciable amount, not necessarily a very serious amount, in the natural course of events, which means such things as the inventory situation, the consumer credit situation, the housing situation, capital goods situation, all of which tend on the whole to operate in cycles, and which on the whole could not be continued, in my opinion, indefinitely at the rate which we see them developing right now. And of course, I am now expressing merely the views of an experienced conservative economist who expects history to repeat itself, 
or the pattern of history to repeat itself. You have an unknown factor which is government intervention. The government, it seems to me, is committed now through both parties to intervene perhaps nationally to prevent any serious decline in the business activity which is accompanied by substantial unemployment. I might say that you could have substantial unemployment with an increase in the gross national product and with apparent prosperity merely because of the development of productivity. And we are approaching an interesting period in which I believe the intentions of the government vis-a-vis employment will be tested out. Last year we expected it would be tested out, but it was not. We were all very pleasantly surprised. I think in the next five years such a test will take place, and I think you will see, in all probability, the government taking action of an important kind to prevent large-scale unemployment. The Chairman. You think the government should add an element of stability to the normal fluctuating economy? Mr Graham. The government will try. The Chairman. It will depend upon the wisdom of the government's policy. Mr Graham. Yes, I guess if you judge the wisdom in terms of results. The Chairman. How do you judge wisdom? Mr Graham. I have a priori test of wisdom in most cases. I think in economics it is very difficult to tell what is wise until you have been through it. The Chairman. I suppose I should not ask you to look back and see what happened in the 20s to see who was wise in administration of government, should I? Mr Graham, I think not. The Chairman, what is your commodity reserve plan? I understand you have one. Mr Graham, I can put it in very few words. It is related to your question as to the future of our economic system. In the last 20 years, I have been identified with a concept of stabilising the economy by stabling the price level of raw materials taken as a whole and not in individual commodities. The objective has been to permit individual commodities to fluctuate but to establish a narrow range of fluctuation and virtual stability for the value of a market based on the important commodities. I have added to it the very important factor, quite radical, that those commodities would represent a sound backing for our money because they represent the things that we need and use, and so by doing this they would become commodity reserves and would be self-financing in the same way our gold reserves are self-financing. The consequence would be that by stabilising pretty well the general level of raw material prices, you would add a very important degree of stability to the general economy. The Chairman I do not think I quite understand what the limitation of the commodities involved would be. Mr Graham, these are major storable commodities for the most part, those dealt with in our commodity exchanges, but not absolutely. The Chairman, what agricultural commodities, if any, would it include? Mr Graham, it would include such products as wheat, corn, cotton, sugar and rubber. The Chairman, rubber and cotton would be storable indefinitely. Mr Graham, they would be storable indefinitely through rotation. The Chairman, With regard to government policy and interference, do you regard tax policy as of major importance in this element of interference in the economic system? Mr Graham, it could be. That is to say that one of the means by which government could intervene to an important degree in the economy would be through a tax reduction plan. Another method would be through an increase of its expenditures. The Chairman, when you find a special situation and you decide, just for illustration, that you can buy for 10 and it's worth 30 and you take a position and then you cannot realise it until a lot of other people decide it's worth 30. How is the process brought about? By advertising or what happens? Mr Graham, that is one of the mysteries of our business and it is a mystery to me as well as everybody else. We know from experience that eventually the market catches up with the value. It realises it in one way or the other. The Chairman, but do you do anything to help that? Do you advertise or what do you do? Mr Graham, on the contrary, we try as a matter of fact to keep our operations as confidential as we can. The Chairman, even after you buy. Mr Graham, even after we have acquired our shares. The Chairman, why? Mr Graham, basically for the reason that we just are not interested in other people knowing about our business and we have no interest in endeavouring to persuade people to buy stocks in which we have ownership. We have never done it and we will never do it. The Chairman. That is rather unusual. Since you make your capital gains, a lot of people have got to decide it is worth 30.
Mr Graham, we have been very fortunate in our experience by finding that other people will decide that the stock you mention is worth 30 without the necessity of our doing anything about it on the advertising side. We might conceivably at times intervene in a managerial policy. We might suggest some change in the procedure, but that, of course, is merely because we are substantial stockholders. The chairman, I think this is about all. There are many other things which I could ask you, I'm sure. However, you have other things to do and the hour is late. I would like to express the appreciation of the committee for you having taken your time to come down here and volunteer this information. I am sure it is not very pleasant for you to have to talk about these things, but I know no other way we can learn about them. Mr Graham, if I have made a contribution, I do not mind the discomfort. The Chairman, if you have any further suggestions that occur to you which we ought to know about, we will welcome you writing them to us. Thank you very much for coming. Statement of Benjamin Graham of the Graham New... The Statement of Benjamin Graham, Chairman of the Graham Newman. Mr Graham's full prepared statement is as follows. Statement of Benjamin Graham, Chairman of Graham Newman Corporation. My name is Benjamin Graham. I live in Scarsdale, New York. I am chairman of the Graham New I am chairman of the Graham Newman Corporation, a registered investment company or investment fund. I am also a junk professor I am also a junk professor of finance at the Graduate School of Business Columbia University. This statement will address itself mainly to three points. One the present level of stock prices from the standpoint of relationship between price and value. 2. Causes of the rise in the stock market since September 1958. 2. Causes of the rise in the stock market since September 1953. 3. Feasible methods of controlling excesses. 3. Feasible methods of controlling excessive speculation in the future. With regard to the present level of stock prices, I find gap new paragraph. With regard to the present level of stock prices, common stocks look high and are high, but they are not as high as they look. The market level of industrial stock is far above the 1929 high shown by the national shown by the Standard & Poor Index of 420 industrials. The present figure is above 300, as compared with 1929, high of 195. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, at about 410, is now only moderately above 1929, high of 382, but the difference would be much larger, except for the substitutions made in average. However, the railroad and utility companies as a whole are well below the 1929 highs. The true measure of common stock values, of course, is not found by reference to the price movements alone, but the price relation to earnings, dividends, future prospects, and to a small extent, asset values.